Welcome to The Break Room, where it doesn't matter who you are or what reality you're from, we're here to deliver a fourth wall break and help you escape your daily grind. Before we get started, slap that like button, become a subscriber, and if you haven't yet, set notifications to all videos so you never miss a beat. Now let's get into it. Today we're going to talk about The Eternals. This movie got a bad reputation before it was even released due to poor critic reviews, specifically on Rotten Tomatoes. And honestly, that inspired me to do something I've actually never done. Right after I got home from the theater, I left a positive review. Join me in doing that if you want, or don't. I don't really care. With that being said, I'm not going to get into a ton of the details of the movie itself, because A, it was a long one, and B, I'm a little disappointed. It didn't do what I hoped it would do in regards of introducing at least the concept of mutants, and I was really leaning into that. In fact, I was considering putting together a theory video prior to the Eternals release, talking about the possibility of the concept of mutants being introduced and what that would mean for the MCU going forward. And now, kind of glad I didn't. Reason being, though, this is actually a good segue into the first post credit scene. As most of you might know, in the comics, the Eternals are one third of the types of beings on the planet Earth. The Eternals while not android in the comics, cannot reproduce. And clearly they have all their superpowers and things that we could just aspire to, right? But the other two-thirds are made up of deviants who can reproduce and evolve. And then also humans who in the comics have the potential to become mutants if the X gene in their DNA is activated. Why this actually serves as a segue to the first post-credit scene is because in it, we're introduced by Pip the Troll My eyes are numb. to Star Fox, aka Eros, the brother of Thanos. Now, in the comics, Thanos and Eros are also brothers, but Thanos has a deviant gene, and there's no mystery as to how their father and mother were able to reproduce in the comics, just a lot of explaining. And in this universe, Star Fox welcomes our heroes as My fellow Eternals. Which makes you all kind of think about that post credit scene as Alright, is Star Fox an android as well? And if he is, does that make us wonder more about Thanos and whether or not he's possibly an android? Basically, the MCU has a lot of explaining to do. Or does it? Thanos actually adopts his daughters Nebula and Gamora. He turns Nebula into essentially a cyborg and keeps trying to upgrade her. Almost as if he has a familiarity with technological beings, <clears throat> his family. There are tons of theories that expand on this even more if you look across the internet since last Thursday. Um, talking about whether or not Thanos knew what he was doing in a larger sense with the snap and thinking that he was actually delaying the Celestials from doing what they're going to do to not only Earth, but a lot of other planets across the galaxy. My thought on that is this. If he knew about that ahead of time and he also knew how much power he was literally holding in his hands with all those Infinity Stones... Why wouldn't he just destroy the Celestials? I, I don't think he would just delay, delay. I, I think he would go straight to war with them. But that's just me. And, you know, either way you think about it, it's fun to talk about. Speaking of talking, I think it's time we get into the next post credit scene. Which, uh, that was my favorite, to be honest with you. This is the one where Dane Whitman does some talking to a sword, and then gets a talking to, and we all were speculating for, what, maybe a day and a half about who actually talked to him at the end? Talking about this guy. Sure you ready for that, Mr. Whitman? This guy's voice. Sure you ready for that, Mr. Whitman? Did you hear it? This guy's voice? Sure you ready for that, Mr. Whitman? That one, yeah. Spoiler alert, it's Blade, and he's there to recruit Dane Whitman to the Midnight Suns. This is probably the more predictable and understandable of the two scenes, to be honest with you. And that's because any comic book reader that was watching this movie was the whole time or 
the limited scenes that we saw Kit Harington actually uh, was connecting the dots that Dane Whitman, his character, would wind up being the Black Knight. Um, he talks a little bit. His, his uncle is mentioned. Cersei actually asks him to make amends with him and yada yada. We, we all knew it was coming, you know? Um, if the NCU is anything like the comics, though, then what we're going to get with Whitman is him drawing power from the sword, but also possibly be corrupted by it the longer he uses it and the more blood he spills with it. In the comics, the sword is actually cursed and the more blood spilled with the sword, the, the more the sword really kind of starts to take over the man, if that makes sense. Also in the comics, the Black Knight at points is an Avenger, a time traveler, and at the least an exciting and interesting character to see on screen. And I can't think of, honestly, anyone better than Kit Harington to be playing this character. I mean, come on guys, he, he was Jon Snow for a decade. And going from that right to the Black Knight, uh, yeah, I'm in. Anyway, guys, that's all I have for you today. Um, I'll probably be back at it on Friday or sometime this weekend just to discuss some of the many things rumored to be talked about on Disney Plus Day. Um, I know there's talk about the Boba Fett show getting a trailer, Kenobi getting a trailer, some awesome Star Wars stuff and with that I'm sure we're going to get a lot of cool MCU trailers coming at us as well um, but as always this has been your fourth wall break and now your moment of memes <laughs>